Okie dokie. Let's get started. So hello everyone and thank you for joining us for Noelle's very, very exciting q and I'm so excited to talk about An Empress of Air and Chaos. Yeah. One of the greatest books in the world, if I do say so. Love <laughs> Um, and I know that there are so many questions that you guys have. So please, at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A button. Feel free to just bombard us with as many questions as you want. Um, we do have quite a few that we have to get through, but we'll be chopping and changing from some questions that have been asked on social media and then some in this chat. And uh, we want to give you guys some exclusives. So this is going to be really exciting. We're going to talk book two a little bit later. Um, and this event will be running for around um, 50 minutes um, to allow some time for everyone to get onto the next event. So um, shall we get started? So Noelle, I, I mean, I, you're one of probably my best friends, so I know a lot <laughs> about you, but um, can you kind of tell everyone what your background is, um, how you got into writing and, and a, bit about, a bit about why you started writing this book? Absolutely. So guys, if you don't know me, if this is the first time that you have come to one of the events that I'm co-hosting with Melissa we do them quite regularly um I'm Noelle I am a fantasy author that is my genre as you can see probably above as well it's the genre that I read it's the genre that I watch on tv um and I kind of specialize or should say that I try to specialize in um the new adult kind of part of um fantasy I did try and write YA and we'll probably talk about that later but yeah YA was um, a struggle for me to stay in the the boundaries of YA <laughs> um, so yeah I started writing when lockdown came in like I'm a baby writer I am new to the business I am new to the world um, but I am super inspired by, like, I was really, really inspired by journaling as a kid. Um, I journaled, I mean, the majority of my, like, adolescent journals are sitting behind me on this, one of these shelves somewhere. Um, so I journaled and I just fell in love with, like, rhetorical questions and questions that really make you think about yourself and, and when you start to write how you find yourself in writing. Um, but I had never really wrote in that manner until lockdown. I, I do have a, an honours degree in theatre, so I did a lot of script writing and, and writing for play, like playwright and stuff like that. But I never wrote a novel to the level of what I did when I started An Empress of Air and Chaos. Um, I was naive. I didn't want to do the gardening one day. <laughs> <laughs> And my partner always slags me for this. He's like, the only reason that book is on that shelf is because <laughs> you wanted to get out of the garden. And, but yeah, I, I've had characters, like my mum's always said, I've had like such a vivid imagination. Um, and I suppose I just took the plunge. I started to feel the urge to write. Um, and I thought, do you know what? I'm not going to suppress it any longer. I'm going to just open word let's see what happens. I mean, I didn't even know about formatting or paragraphing or what I was supposed to be doing at the time. Um, but I got ideas onto paper and quotes and scenes and it just developed into the things that are above me right now. Oh, wow. <laughs> so the very first thing that you wrote ever, except for like journaling and things, was An Empress of Erin Chaos. That is yeah. amazing. Wow. And how long did it take you to write this book? So we went into lockdown in March and I don't think I started writing until early April time. Um, so I started in early April time and then November came up and I saw this mad thing called NaNoWriMo, <laughs> National yes. Writing Month. Yeah. And I had a lot of drafts of book one. But then I started to think maybe I could write book two as well. Um, so I decided to write book two and the kind of constraints of NaNoWriMo, but I actually carried it on until about January to finish it. Um, so then I went back to book one and solidly started to really like nail down what we had to do to get it published. Mm -hmm. And then I got it, pub well, it was self-published on the 14th of August this year. Yeah, this year. And um, how long will the series be? You've mentioned book two. I know you've mentioned a book three. Is it going to be a trilogy? Is it going to go on for longer? 
I've got this funny feeling that we're not done after book three. Oh my um, God. I don't know if I'm going to change it up after book three. Um, I'm considering changing. Uh, we do. I, I write in multiple a multiple POV. I, I write in multiple points of view anyway, and you'll see that in an Empress of Aiden Chaos. But um, I think I might change into some sort of spin off, but we don't know yet. We'll play around with it, and I'll see. I'll see how it goes. Oh, wow, that's so exciting! I can't wait for that. Um, what is your writing process like? I'm really interested to know. Um, oh. Just because, especially <laughs> if this is like your first, your first piece of work. That is, no, that is amazing. So um, where did you start and what was your process like? I am so character driven, probably to a fault. Um, so when I started conjuring up like the idea of brothers and this brotherhood or clan or some sort of kind of fighting squad, um, I was like, see if I dropped a love interest into that how would that develop and I really started to kind of get the ideas and I let that flow and now I do have a solid writing process um at the beginning it was literally just trial and error let's see what happens let's see how it goes um but right now my writing process is I work full time um so I work full time and I probably work from about half eight in the morning till about five I give myself an hour to unwind de-stress come back to earth and then I take myself off into like writing land it's probably until about nine o'clock um sometimes it can be a bit later sometimes it can be earlier um I'm not always like regimented with that because I think sometimes that can really stop creativity so I try and make that um fluid but also consistent does that make sense yeah um so my writing process really goes with I am not a plotter. <laughs> Some people are like really into plotting, like this is the scene, this is what it's going to be, this is what needs to happen. I quite like to let my characters run and see where they go, but also knowing that there needs to be a direction. Um, there has to be a direction or otherwise you could end up with 20,000 words worth of nothing. Um, so I start by quotes. I get these scenes and quotes in my mind. I write them into notes so that I don't forget them because you get up in the middle of the night and you're like, oh my God, that's amazing. I need to put that down into my notes. Um, and then I start to work out scenes and world building round about that. Strip it all back, go back in, do all these different kind of techniques with it to see if I need to withdraw or put more in or see where is it a character that needs to come out or is it a character that's needed is is my story where it needs to be basically yeah so yeah amazing and we're going to talk characteristics and more about your characters in a moment but first for anyone who has this book um it is just the cover for example is just designed so well I think it's I honestly think it's one of the nicest books, the prettiest books that I've ever seen in my entire life. Just the oh. fact that it's so like, the only word that comes to mind is like sleek. It's so sleek um, and so pretty. Um, what was the process for your cover design? Did you do that yourself um, as a self-published author or did you hire someone? Can you tell us a little bit about that? So I am, and, and Melissa knows this, but for anyone that's watching, I am the biggest technophobe in the world. <laughs> like technology and Noel Rain just don't go in the same sentence. <laughs> so um yeah, I had to hire someone, but I was very close to someone who had done a few projects for me before because I started my own theater school. Mm -hmm. Um so I needed graphics and stuff like that for my theatre school when I was running that. Um, so I got in contact with the girl. I really liked her. She was really, really um, good at what she does. She's fantastic. I literally give her a few briefs and she goes in and she just brought it to life. Um, and she will say, listen, that's not going to work. So I've just thought about this. What about this? Yeah, And it was just, it was so easy. It was flawless for her to, to do it, um, the actual cover. So yeah, and, and I had an idea. I didn't want there to be any faces. Um, I didn't want the characters to be on the cover um, because I'm quite, I, I, I love to visualise 
my own characters when I'm reading. So sometimes when you see them on the front of a cover, I'm kind of like, oh, that's maybe not how I would have pictured that reading that. So I wanted to keep it quite mysterious and dark and everything that the book is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it definitely looks amazing. Some people in the comments have said, I love the hardcover edition. That's what I've got here. The hardcover is so worth it. It really is. It's honestly stunning. Um, so let's get into the juicy stuff. What character do you re relate to most in An Empress of Air and Chaos? Oh my goodness. Okay, I so... want you to pick one and everyone else can die. <laughs> everyone else gets thrown into a ditch and you, you have one to save. Um, so I'm going to save Amara because Amara is the lead character. So if, if anyone's in the, um, or anyone that's watching and you haven't read An Empress of Air and Chaos, it starts with Amara um, and she is kind of very naive to the world that's going on round about her, but very quickly, I think it's like chapter three I think we're thrust into this new world that's all about magic and demons and demon hunters and some underlying politics that's kind of happening in the background and that's going to continue into book two and book three etc um so yeah it gets dark pretty quickly <laughs> um so I'd pick Amara because I think she is just she takes everything in her stride and I think she Although she struggles within the book and although she has struggles, she's not pathetic about it. And I know that sounds like terrible, but she really like works through it and yeah. she kind of tries to think logically about what she's going to do, how she's going to like make the best of the situation. And yeah, there's probably a lot of myself in Amara, but the other character traits and every other character like the, 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 the bad stuff is also me so I don't know <laughs> I think which, I think I'm, I'm gonna have to save Amara. Which um, character do you think you relate to the most? So would you say you relate mostly to Amara mm. or is there another character that you see yourself more similar as? I would probably say I'm a massive mixture of her best friend Callie and myself and I think um, I'm very sharp and and quite strong headed like Callie and I like to push boundaries and I like to challenge social forms um but I'm also like I like to think of myself <laughs> I don't know if anyone else does um, I like to think of myself as quite logical and like okay how can we resolve this how can we sort this out because that's kind of what like Amara's like um but I see myself in a few of the characters, like especially Torin, um, who has a crowd favourite. We'll probably see some uh, some top team Torins coming out just now. Um, I see a lot of myself in him because he's quite misunderstood. Um, we see this front, we see this figure, um, and when you actually start to peel some layers back, it's not quite what it seems. So yeah. We've had we've had some team torrents in the chat. Absolutely, <laughs> it's a crowd favorite. Um, have any of the characters that you wrote surprised you while writing? Is there anything that kind of cropped up that you maybe was shocked at? Yeah, absolutely. I never planned, and I, I've probably spoke about this with you. Um, I never planned to write a love triangle. Um, it was never supposed to be a love triangle between. Spoiler alert, Torin, Amara, and Gideon, who is Ge who is Torin's brother. So that's the Black Sea brothers. You've got Gideon and Torn and Keelan as well. Um, he's just a little younger, but we get into get into a swing of him a bit a bit later on in the season. Um so yeah, it surprised me when writing Torin because I actually found that he had so much chemistry with Amara when I was writing scenes. And I was like, hold on a second, <laughs> this isn't supposed <laughs> to happen. Our yeah. only love interest was supposed to be Gideon. Um, but yeah, I thought, why not? Let's see how it goes. So when writing that, it was it was quite a surprise to see that. Yeah, and I think that's actually added a lot of dynamic to that character as well, to both of them. You kind of see what they're like when they have to match up to each other, see the jealousy um, yeah. and see how they react to that situation. So, oh, that's really exciting. Yeah. Um, so this is a tough question, but what is your favourite chapter? Do you have a favourite chapter? I have a few, so I'm going to tell you a few of them. Yeah. One of the chapters that I absolutely loved writing, there's there's one where um, Torrance had a moment with his dad who 
is basically arranging a marriage for Torin. Torin, because he's the first in line to the Black Steel clan, um, he has to marry for love. Uh, sorry, not love. He has to marry for an alliance um, and has to really kind of think politically about his match, um, whereas Gideon doesn't. And after they've had a kind of situation happening, um, Amara finds Torin on the roof and I thought it was a really lovely moment because it's the first time that we see um, a softer side to Torin's character because he's really um, mischievous and he's got these one-liners that are so kind of harsh and borderline like inappropriate or <laughs> inappropriate um, so it was kind of nice to play around with that side of Torin um, and the second one that I really loved writing was um, the scene where it's at the the uplift and it's basically a ball that the the magic community can go to to like start arranged marriages and and find people um of their own kind and there's again there's just this lovely moment of chemistry where he's just not who you think he is um and then any scene with Callie and I, I just I loved writing. I actually really loved writing um, the kind of end scene as well with the two brothers, just seeing the dynamic with with them and seeing how it was going to play out. So yeah, amazing. Is that fear? Uh, Is so we're going to talk spoilers in a second and we're going to talk book two in a second. Um, there is a few more questions that I have, but if anyone has any questions specifically about An Empress of Air and Chaos, book one, or about Noelle's writing process or anything like that, um, feel free to ask them in the Q&A or in the chat and we'll get onto that before we move on. So the next question, um, is there something in the first book that you wrote and you chose not to add it in? Oh, yes. Yes, this is a good question because I've never been asked this question before. Um, and I actually, as we see Amara, so Amara is a virgin when we start an Empress of Aiden Chaos. Um, and she is a virgin when we leave an Empress of Aiden Chaos. Um, and I actually decided to write a sex scene to explore that with Amara and Gideon. Um, and as I was writing it, I kind of took it to the next level, um, which kind of brought it into YA, uh, bringing it up from YA into any, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't go through with it. So I did write a lot of that scene, like a sexual experience as a first time sexual experience, mm -hmm. but it just didn't feel right. So I took it out. Um, and a lot of people was like oh like you really should have like put in that that's like what sells like that you're in an any novel it needs to be you need to have some sort of spice in there and I had to argue my case and say absolutely not it's not right for the character um and I just didn't feel like it was the right time for Amara um there's a really really good scene where her and Gideon are together and they're in the infirmary he's just kind of like woken up from a, a serious condition that he had due to um a fight etc and it was a really lovely moment it could have went there but I just felt it's not true to Amara and it's just not it wasn't it wasn't time so I did write it but no I had to take that out yeah and I feel especially with this book there it does have spice it's a spicy book but it's in different ways and I find that yeah. sometimes that's uh, a better way arguably to add spice mm -hmm. um, because there's kind of um, they're not all into it there's kind of yeah. some withdrawal there's kind of some secrecy that you want to find out as a reader um, yeah. so yeah this is definitely a spicy book <laughs> yeah um, and it, yeah, yeah go it has it has that sort of intimacy that's not on like a touching level it has an intimacy that's kind of trying to delve into something a bit more deeper and a bit more that when it does happen it's going to be the right time so yeah yeah, yeah. someone in the in the chat said burn burn <laughs> <laughs> We've had a few questions come through. Um, one of them is, what was your editing process? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> the editing process for me, I was probably naive to the editing process. Um, I didn't realize how many drafts I was going to go through and see if you actually asked me how many drafts I did of an Empress of Air and Chaos. 
I have no idea. So that's why I'm drafting this time. I'm actually counting the drafts that I'm doing for book two and I will for book three. Um, so the drafting process for me was pretty much get your words onto paper, try and get a structure, see how your book's going to go and then pick it apart. Yeah. Pick it apart, pick it apart, find loopholes, find them early enough because then you can write round them. And if they're not big enough, that's fine because um, you can write round it and tie it all in. But the quicker that you find any loopholes, the better. Um, but also the quicker, the longer you leave it. And I think we were talking about this just not that long ago. You, you let it breathe. You let your, your document, your work breathe because literally two, I think it was two days ago for book two, and I'm writing book three, I had a thought and I was like, that's how I'm going to tie that together because I let it breathe and I, I give it enough time to sit. And that's why I kind of, I work through book two and book three and book one pretty close together um, because you're able to tie bits in and out whilst you're still working. Because if I finished book one and then went straight on to book two, book one's a finished document, it's done. I can't change anything in that. Um, and I'm not saying go out and write all these different books. It's just, it makes it easier for me to tie in my magic world. Um, so yeah, once I start to get all that moving, I then make sure my full structure's there mm -hmm. and I'll go in and start the editing process. And the editing process for me means that I am not touching grammar. I'm not touching um, spelling mistakes. If I'm, I mean, if I can see them, I'll go in and, and rectify them. But I'm not worrying myself about that. I'm really looking at how my sentences are flowing, how my chapters are flowing. And then I'll go back and do that until I can see enough work there that I can then pass it to beta readers or an editor or someone that's a, a different eye from me. Because, wait, and I'll show you this, if I can see it. Oh, no, I, I don't think I've got it here. Basically, I've got a book that I thought was a finished document and it wasn't there was so many mistakes in it um and it's just because my eye and my brain starting to read how I think it should read and yeah. it's not how it reads so yeah get someone else to look at your work someone that you trust do you have any advice for how people can find beta readers and critique partners um I've got an alpha reader right so an alpha reader is someone of my family um, that's my cousin and that's the first person that ever read any of my work and she's probably the first person that said you know what like this is good like go and do something with this um, and she had never read fantasy before and it was good because she could then ask questions that a fantasy writer or watcher or reader would never ask so things like a portal if we are transporting into a different world in our minds we know how that works because we read so many books about things like that where yeah. she's like how does that work like what does that mean and she kind of question things that fantasy readers wouldn't so get someone that doesn't read fantasy to read your work if it's fantasy obviously um but also if you're going to have beta readers you want to start relationships with people online because you're not going to find 15 beta readers that are your friends um, but you do need to trust them and you do need to have a kind of document to say this work is my work this work is um, a legal document to say listen you can't change anything with this you can obviously make suggestions to me as the, the creative director but you can't change anything or take anything or publish it <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, protect yourself for sure but I would say put out the words um, can I put out some feelers, see what people respond. You need to be advertising that you're looking for that. You need to be clearing what it is you're actually advertising for because you can get better readers who are just not even interested. It's not fantasy that they read. It's not romance that they read. It's, they're offended because it's only YA that they read, but yet your book has adult themes in it. So just be careful how you go about the, the beta reading process, yeah. for sure. That was really great advice. Um, the next question is a bit of a spoiler, spoilery question. So listen at your own peril or just mute this for literally one or two minutes. Um, so there was a death and uh, in an episode of Chaos, uh, Air and Chaos. And here is the spoiler, guys. Did you plan Callie's death or did it just evolve as you wrote or was that kind of always in the cards? 
it was always in the cards for our Cali, unfortunately. Um, I needed a catalyst big enough to spark Amara's full potential. Um, and our Cali was the, the catalyst, unfortunately. Um, I wasn't concerned about killing off Cali's character because I knew it had to happen. We had to let go of that final tie to her old life as she moves through into her next challenges and, and parts of her her new life and, and what she's going to make for herself. Um, so yeah, and you know, I actually got really upset as I was writing it. Um, <laughs> I cried um, and I could cry thinking about it now because I just remember at that time, like writing it and feeling Amara's raw emotion as it was happening was just, oh, I had to take like moments just to myself. So yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about it, but I'm, I'm not Very too much. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um okay yeah yeah I think a lot of people probably cried watching that reading that um bit as well so yeah I agree it it needed to happen I think um and so many people like just messaged me why why have you done this um, why <laughs> and it's one of those times where you just sit and it's like the doctor evil from Austin Powers and you're just like oh, yeah <laughs> Sorry, Penny. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Someone in the comments said, Oh, cried my eyes out. I was slash am so mad. Well, you have a lot of answering to do, it seems. <laughs> I do. I do. And, I'm sorry, guys. Can we expect um any more deaths or anything like that in upcoming books, in book two, in book three? I think you should never trust an author. That's all I'm gonna say. You should never trust an author. Um what I will say is, trust me with how the direction is going, um, but ultimately don't trust me, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's start talking book two. We did have a question for book two. Um, someone wants to know, are you planning to give out arcs for the second book? So this was something that I had to really 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 think about and and if you're a writer and are you going to be an author or whatever you're doing um to touch base with being a writer or self-publishing please think about this because it's not something that I did with book one and I am happy with that because book one I needed to get book one out there, um, but I didn't want to take anything away from my sales because let's be serious, you're a new author, you're a debut author, you need to get any sale that you possibly can. Yeah. Um, and maybe that's naivety, I just didn't want to hand over my work to people just to read for free. Um, so there's a lot of work that goes into a book, guys. If you've, if you've started the process, you'll know. If you're about to start the process, then absolutely reach out to someone and, and talk about it first because it's a, it's a big deal and I've said to myself that I am doing an art team this time round. Okay. The art team is going to be based around my hype team and the reason for that is because these people have read my books and they've been with me since day one or they're starting to, to be in the hype team and they're already part of the kind of rain family house rain that we're, we're creating so um that will po possibly be my my art team but they need to there's obviously certain things that that we need to discuss if they're going to be part of the art team yeah and do you um are you taking submissions for your hype team or do you plan on expanding that in the future yeah, so there's currently three spaces just now on the, the hype team because I just started processing, sorry I'm getting messages, I just started processing the hype team as I was getting married, I don't know why I did it, it was bad timing but I just needed to get some more people into place because the hype team was starting to dissolve ever so slightly just after your first it was only for a initial yeah. like launch team basically um so I will be looking at more places on the hype team um coming into the new year I've already got applications sitting there that I think they'll be great so I'm going to touch out to them but yeah you probably could if anyone's interested just reach out to me and let me know and we can chat about it exciting so let's talk some more book two questions this is one that I personally want to know, and I'm very interested in the in the answer. Will we see Amara kick some ass in book two? Please. 
<laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> Amara comes back bigger and better and stronger. And she has that kind of revenge type, like, I'm not going to let these people or like this army, this dark army come in, destroy everything that I've ever known, um, take away possibilities for what's happening in, in my life, etc. So yeah, she's she's got a, a backbone and she's ready to to fight and book to Anthony. <laughs> how um this is a separate question, but how um have you kind of developed her character arc? Is that there- will you be able to see this change quite prominently from book one to book two? You'll see it straight away because book two picks up where book one finished. Mm-hmm. So it's literally, like, so we actually start with, in, in the, with the comments, we'll see this one again. It starts with Torrin's point of view um, and he's kind of trying to manoeuvre through what has just happened because at the end of the book we see that massive um explosion with the fighting and the chaos and it's where the name and the title actually comes from um and we kind of pick right back up where we left off but at a different kind of angle so we're kind of looking at it from a hunter's mindset this time instead of amara because she's trying to process it all and then we go in to see her um her poor wee thoughts and our our, our broken heart and we see a lot of that and then we see her getting stronger again and we see her we actually see probably more vulnerabilities in Amara this time round because it's probably been such a shock for her to lose like her gran and then straight into Cali and then straight into like everything that's happening um and yeah she really uses that and she she makes a decision pretty early on that she's not going to let this defeat her um and she is badass <laughs> that's what what we like to hear um do we get to see more of Torin in book two <laughs> you don't get rid of Torin in book oh, two guys <laughs> I'm I'm team Torin so <laughs> yeah I'm shocked that you've been team Torin Melissa really yeah I thought you would have liked Gideon well we'll see maybe <laughs> Maybe in book two it'll change. You never know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what are you most excited for readers to discover in book two? Um, I think we see... I'm actually excited to explore a bit more of Kildorna. So... Um, it kind of they set off. They're going to the, Ameth- the, the Amethyst Palace because a certain thing needs to happen for Amara um I don't want too many spoilers but yeah she has to leave the tower behind but obviously the black steels follow um and she we see some new relationships form um some characters that we've never met and I think they actually might be my favorite characters um (laughs) yeah oh my goodness like there's banter but so we, we met we meet Briley who's the wolf uh who's the shifter's daughter um she's a shifter she's a shifter too um and we meet her new love interest and it is so explosive it's great <laughs> amazing um when you write your characters um how do you keep from being super biased towards one part especially with um Amara and, and the Black Steel Brothers how do you keep from being biased towards one part of the love triangle um, to write from the other person? It can be difficult um, because ultimately I know where it's going um, and I don't need the readers to know that at that point. However, um, I think it's quite easy to write from their point of views separately and I do separate it because they're not the same characters um so if you know your characters well enough and you've done that and they kind of going through everything you know everything about that character it should be easier to write from their point of view um and and you think about it like they're not all in love with each other they might be in love with the same person but you do have to kind of pull back and really have your blinkers on because they don't know what's happening off in the other corner that you can only see from their point of view yeah yeah 
And for, for Torin, who is the inspiration for Torin? And <laughs> is, is he single? <laughs> <laughs> when this question came through, I couldn't stop laughing. Um, <laughs> there's actually no one in particular that matches Torin. Um, there's probably traits from my husband. There's probably traits from Damon Salvatore from Vampire Diaries. Um, any bad morally grey strapping big man <laughs> like, <laughs> um that's probably where I take the inspiration from it, do you know what Torin is probably just my type <laughs> and that's how it came about amazing uh we have had a question come through saying did you write your chapters in order I try to um, I try to write my, my chapters in order because I'm impatient, right? So if you've read my book, there was a scene at the very end that I saw happening very, very quickly on, but I had to take my time to get to that point, okay? And the reason I didn't write that part as I saw it was because I needed to feel that journey before I actually got there because that's what made it even more powerful um I try and although I might have an idea I'll note that down and I'll have lots of quotes and notes um is what I'm going to do in go order but I will try and write it in chronological order yeah. I don't I will go back in, so see if um, there's something that's needed or required. I'll go back in and I'll write a scene or I'll develop a scene further. Um, but I can't, I'm not one of these people who can like write scene five before scene one and scene 60 before scene 20. Like I'm, I'm not that kind of gal. I don't have the ability. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, so I can see your bookshelf in the background, many, many books on there. Who are your favorite authors? And did any kind of inspire you to write An Empress of Air and Chaos? Or are there any that you kind of are in a similar genre that you you looked out to um, before, before you wrote your book? Oh God, there's so many, Melissa. And I think the, one of the biggest ones, do you know what? I started with Stephanie Meyer. I started with Twilight. I was a Twi hard when I was younger. I am still not ashamed to say that I absolutely love the Twilight books. I love the movies. Um, and it really got me into fantasy. And then I started with Cassandra Clare and then her Inferno Devices. So they've got special parts in my heart because like it's how I started out as like a total fangirl of these <laughs> amazing series that I, I follow now and then I get sweeped into the, the fandom that is Sarah Jai Mass because how she writes and I mean I've listened to all her audiobooks I've read all her books multiple times I'm just in awe at how she story tells um <laughs> I think she's stunning in her writing and I love, 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 love the chemistry between um, Jennifer Armand Trout's characters. So I love how character driven she is as well, because she writes quite similar to me. Um, she's very, very character driven. I mean, you've read from Blood and Ash, so you can see there's a lot of characters there and then the, the world's built, built around them. That's yeah. kind of how I write as well. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, and Dan Brown. I love Dan Brown. Anything Dan Brown I'll read, so yeah. Good view, good view. <laughs> and uh, so I want to talk um, more about your publishing process and more about marketing as well. Um, if there are any other questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or in Q&A. Um, but for publishing, so say that you, you finished your manuscript, what was then your next step? Once you had this manuscript and you said, I think I'm ready, what, mm -hmm. what did you do after that? I panicked <laughs> I completely was like what where what happens where did I go now and then I found you <laughs> and that's no word of a lie like that is no word of a lie I was do you know that way you, you dip your toe into it all um you've kind of looked at your big providers like Kindle Direct Publishing Ingram Spark you know that they're there you know what's happening but you don't know or you don't quite know how to go about it 
Um, so that's when I found myself, I need a writing community. I really need to immerse myself into the writing community. I've built up enough of following to get interested in the book, but yeah. now I really need to see how I get that book into my reader's hands. Um, and it was difficult. It was a difficult process for me and it was a learning curve for me. And you do have to be committed to it. If you're not committed to it, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Sorry to say that, it is not going to happen if you're not ready to really, really dive in and punch this through. Um, so I found you guys and then I, I had to decide what I was going to do with like the hardback, the ebook, and the paperback. You kind of need to know that early on. And mm -hmm. I would probably encourage anyone that's sitting here ready to be at that stage to do that pretty quickly. Um, because as you know, we had a lot of trouble with the the dynamics of my book and I hadn't sized it correctly and I hadn't sized the wording right and there was a lot of stuff that I, ha I had to then go back and change formatting wise yeah. um so do that as you're going guys <laughs> do that as you're going try your hardest to do it as you're going um because it's going to then take a lot of pressure off you when you are ready to submit that book to the person or other people that you're going to do that with mm -hmm. Do you have any advice or words of wisdom for anyone who kind of is thinking about self-publishing and they want to do it, but they just, they're afraid to take that step? I mean, if you think about it, like you are the sole driver of that okay and if you're scared there's probably a reason as to why you're scared it's because you love it so much and you're so excited about it and you just don't want it to fail but it's never going to fail if you put it out there right and the reason it's never going to fail because you've put that out there is because you've actually took the plunge more than people ever will to actually go and do that so don't be terrified to release something out into the world that you don't think your best that is your best work I don't think an end persevering chaos is my best work however I'm super proud of what I got out there and I'm super proud of what's now there so um please please go ahead and just go for it you, you may as well what you got to lose you need to go for it so the next question in the Q&A was can we expect when can we expect the title for book two? Um, so I've played around with a title for book two. Um, I have two that I'm in between. I think I've got it. I think it's it's ready to go. Um, but I probably am going to wait until I go back through the, another draft of it um, because I like to link my books in with their title and to have that there. Um, so yeah I'm, I'm excited to to see how that goes um I have it I'm going to reveal it maybe soon <laughs> I'm hoping I'm hoping I'm hoping I'm just gonna read guys I'm going to read and see um what we've been saying in the comments I think Melissa is or has been flung off guys any other questions anything else that you want to know do you happen to have a book that you're excited to read for 2022 yes I am so excited about Sarah J Mass's new one coming out which I actually think could be my favorite series um it's her new adult series it's the the second book to um Crescent City I am in love with Bryce Bryce is so cool um so badass so amazing and I'm really excited to see where she takes Hunt and Bryce's relationship um, and see what's happening happening there yeah yeah pre-ordered her book amazing is there any specific font you need to use when you're writing yeah I mean I think there's I, I don't think there's any specific if you're going to self-publish there's not you could do whatever font you wanted but if you want to be quite like in and connecting with um the regulatively standards of your traditional publishing it's probably times new roman or is that how you say it new roman times times new roman <laughs> and it's normally between size 11 and size 12 um that's 
probably the most popular font, but there's other fonts that can be considered. And what I normally, or what I did when I was looking at that, I actually had a look to see what fonts or what were similar in the books that I have. Um, and you can get a lot of information like that on, on online. Um, and I had a look to see what sizes the books were, because I didn't do that beforehand. Um, I was quite naive to it all. So um, I had a look to see what was happening um, with the books that I read, um, size-wise, font-wise, was there um, pop-ups, was there anything in there that, that I could use and that I liked? I want to start writing, but I don't know which platform would be great for beginners. Any suggestions? Okay, so do we mean platforms like do we mean platforms like social platforms or just to get into writing? Um, because there's lots of like books or forums or is that what we mean? Just so that I know, that I, so that I can answer that question um, to the best of my ability. Just let me know in here. Are we going to see Torin and Amara get closer in book two? Yes. We are going to see Amara and Torin get much, much, much closer in book two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, Torin, you'll like to know. So I'll give you a bit of a background on that. So Torin, um, through no choice of his own, is having to be partnered up with another three or another two um, hunters. And he has to basically put forth to be Amara's guard. Um, because as we know, at the end of An Empress of Aiden Chaos, she's in line um, to become the next Empress of Aiden Chaos, or she has the blood of the family line that actually um, kind of kind of be the, the Empress of Aiden Chaos, and she kind of outgoes the person that was currently there, even if she was still alive. Um, so with the attacks and with everything that's happening, things are not adding up as to why it's kind of predominantly witches that are getting um, attacked. And that's kind of where Torrin's thought process are, processes are going. And we finally meet the Prime, um, which are the Prime are the leaders of the factions of the magical world so your shifters your fae we get to see the fae king ever so slightly he's more in it in book three um we get to see the minister of coin who is the elite faction he factions the humans um and that all starts to come into it and we get to see the chief commander who um kind of plays some parts in it as well so um we get to see all that a bit more politics in it this time round um and Torin has to be Amara's guard so they're kind of put together again as if fate's bringing it together um but yeah there's twists and there's turns and they've got to go on this journey and then they're dealing with all this kind of chemistry and sexual tension and feelings they're dealing with feelings um and Torin doesn't quite know how to deal with feelings so it's it's exciting to see him explore that So then like Google Documents are just a software. So I use Word and a lot of people don't like Word um, to start writing on. Um, I'm pretty old school and I literally need to write things down. So like I like pa paper and pen if I'm going to like write a structure out or I'll do it on my phone. But I also like, I don't like it kind of up on the screen. I just need to be, uh, I can only do one thing at once. Like I can't listen to music and write. I need it to be a clear screen. Um, So there's, there's been a few times where I've got a writing wall in one of my spare rooms and I've put up, it's kind of like a whiteboard um, and a, you can write on it with your pen and I've seen myself do like mind maps on that and that just kind of helps me visualise things so that I can get straight into writing on Word and I don't have to kind of mess around with any software that's on um, the, the, the laptop because like I said I am not <laughs> I, I cannot work with technology 
Well, we have a Spotify playlist for book two, like we did for book one. Absolutely. I already have a scene in mind and I can see the music. I can see how it would play out if it was a movie. Like, I'm so excited for you to see this scene or hear or read or whatever you guys, how you guys are going to do it. Um, because I just think it's so good. <laughs> That is terrible. <laughs> but yeah, it's a good scene. And I think it's one of these scenes where you're going to be like, <gasps> and I think it's my equivalent to chapter 55, if you know what that is. So there's a spoiler. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions, guys? God, my eyes are running so much, guys. It's because of the ring light. I'm sorry. So glad you wrote an Embers of Reading Chaos. It's one of my all-time favourites. Oh, thank you so much. That's amazing. Thank you. Keep reading it. Keep spreading the word. See the world and meet these characters. Yes, the new characters in book two, the dynamic that Briley has with this new love interest is just so funny, so badass as well, because females, and Briley really challenges this in book two, females are put down for kind of having sex and, and being sexual people, and um, Briley's just having none of that. Like, Briley can sleep with who Briley wants to sleep with, um, and then she meets someone, or she sleeps with someone, and it kind of changes things, but she doesn't want it to. So she tries to fight it so hard. She's not interested. She hates them. Um, she's like, why did I do that? And it's about trying to find and normalise like sexual relationships for women. Um, and we do explore that in book two. Um, and I think that's why book two definitely is new adult and not YA. Um, because an Empress of Wearing Chaos, I mean, if I took a few bad words out of an Empress of Erin Chaos. We could probably put an Empress of Erin Chaos into YA, um, but I always knew book two was going to be steamy. So um, the spice level really rises in book two. And not only for Briley, but for Amara as well. And we do, we see some new connections and we kind of get some seeds planted for other things. And, and it's going to be, it's going to be good. It's going to be a wild ride. And I am scared and nervous to see the reaction to the end. <laughs> because I'll get my evil laugh out again, guys. I'm sorry. Any other questions before we round it up? I know obviously Melissa's messaged me and she's saying that she's had a power cut out in her house, which is craziness. Um, and she is struggling to get on. Um, and she probably won't be back on by the end of this session, guys. So if you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer them whilst we're here. Do you have a set writing schedule? Um, yes, I do have a set writing schedule, but if I don't stick to it, I don't punish myself or I try not to punish myself because I started writer's guilt as a thing, guys. Um, and as you start to write and you know that you've got deadlines and things are happening, things are moving for you, um, you do start to get writer's guilt. Like if you're going out or you've got something else on, you start to feel like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. I've got things to do my word count needs this I've got another editing process that needs to to be done so what I kind of like to do um is I start my work I do my work I probably work between the hours of eight and five I then have some downtime for an hour um I have my dinner I catch up with my husband I see what's happening there um and then I'll go into the writing world and I'll probably write a scene or a chapter, go back up and edit it so that when I'm reading it, it actually makes sense because when you're typing and you're in the zone, like you just go crazy. Um, so I'll go back, I'll reread that, I'll kind of implement what needs to be done and then I'll leave it because I think unless I'm doing a big chunky writing session, so say like on a Saturday when I'm off, I think you need to let that breathe um, and you need to give yourself breaks. So um, 
I absolutely just leave that after that chapter that's that chapter done and I then go back to the next day and then I'll add next chapter next chapter next chapter that's how I like to work but if I'm having a really chunky day at writing and I'm really solidly working through things um I do like to take some breaks because it honestly refreshes your mind and you need that because you're so involved in what you're writing straight away you might not realize that that make that changes this bit at the top or it changes how it's going to happen at the end so yeah I really like to give the the, the actual script the manuscript breaks because they need them and that gives you time to think up here and what's happening so the writing schedule probably goes from about six until eight or nine-ish and then um, I probably won't push myself any more than that because I'm working the next day and you don't want to do or get to burnout because burnout honestly guys is horrendous and if you've ever had writing burnout your your full brain shuts down and you physically start to like not want to write and that's the, the, the last place that you want to be so give yourself some time please don't feel guilty if you've got something on just set self your, yourself some time even if it's an hour um if you can write for an hour each day think about how many words you can get on that paper and that's all that matters any other questions guys just as we finish up i'll come back into the chat and we'll see what we're saying so excited for the next books guys i'm so excited for the next books too because i just want to see how you guys gauge them i'm excited for that did you do a lot of planning prior to writing or do you just let it flow um I'm, I kind of do a bit of both I am not a plotter I don't plot every single part of the book um I probably plot the beginning the middle and the end and then I think up quotes um and the quotes are kind of you kind of know where they're going to go and if you don't know where they're going to go um you can move you can move it around a, a bit um I really didn't have any sort of planning for book one like none <laughs> I just worked around the world as I went and I found ways to tie it in which was very lucky um but with book two I've had to plan a bit more Um, I have not went to great lengths of like months and months of planning. I don't know about you guys, but I just think that hinders a process because you're taking all that time to plan and plan and plan when you could be writing and working through it. And it's kind of like that whole vision thing with the wall, like sometimes you're trying to get around it. You may as well just go through it, just start getting words on a paper and pen or if you're a writer like me and you, you like to do it straight away on your laptop see how it goes um but have your beginning your middle and your end really kind of solidified so you know where it's going and that can change don't be scared for your writing to change my mind changed drastically um so drastically and they'll change when you go into the beta reading process or you have someone review your work or um even as you read it you might think you know that scene doesn't work or i need a scene in here so yeah um it will change so don't be scared of if you've plotted it all out and as you're writing you can't get there change it up don't be scared to do that Anything else, guys, just before we finish up, one last question, if we've got any. Poor Melissa getting stuck. Her Wi-Fi and data is not working, so she can't get on. Oh, bless. Thank you for being such an inspiration. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining, guys. Honestly, it's such a pleasure when you know people are coming on to your event. Um, I do it for you guys. I'm happy to, to converse with you. Um, you guys are the, the people that inspire me because you're going out there to buy the books and you guys are hyping up my books. And if you haven't bought the book, An Persevering Chaos, give it a go, see how you feel it. If you are feeling it, then write a review. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, guys, thank you so, so, so much for coming. Honestly, it's been a pleasure. Um, follow me on Instagram, follow me on Facebook um, and you'll get some teasers, further teasers for book two.
Thank you. See you soon, guys. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day, night, whatever you are. See you later. Bye.